don't know if you guys are tracking all the chat, but we've got folks checking in from all over the country and all over the world. So welcome to everybody for our webinar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Uh, my name is Patrick McCulley, and I want to say howdy from the great state of Texas, but also welcome you to the second uh, webinar as part of our series, but the first one with us as an official chapter of the ICA. Um, as I said, I'm Patrick McCulley. I'm a captain uh, from Texas, and I've been a SEPTED practitioner for over two decades. And I've been blessed to be an ICA member for almost that entire time. On behalf of SEPTED USA and SEPTED Canada, we're excited to have over 150 participants signed up to join us from all over the United States and all over the world. In our previous webcast back in August, speakers from our USA chapter gave an overview and a history of the urban blight pro problem in America. We heard a, from a bunch of experts from all over the country, including myself, Mia Terrasas, a resident organizer from California, Ms. Pamela Daniels, a community organizer from Newark, New Jersey, Dr. Randy Atlas and Ray Burt, who will be joining us today from Miami and from Portland, crime analysis expert Julie Wartell, a lecturer from the University of California, Professor Allison Martin, a criminologist from California, and our very own Greg Seville, urban planner, criminologist from Denver, and the founder of the Safe Growth Movement. So during that event, we took a look at both first and second generation SEPTED and how they can impact urban blight. We examined community safety, crime, toxic street drugs, overcrowding, and the unhoused, and explored multiple concerns about declining urban areas. So today, we're going to build upon that and explore some case studies from all across the country. We're going to unpack some of the specific tactics that our panelists have successfully used to address problems in their areas, and hopefully give you lots of takeaways you can use yourself. Each of our speakers, in very different ways, have used advanced SEPTED, particularly second-generation SEPTED, to address urban problems and build up the capacity empowerment of their diverse communities. But before we start, I want to give a little bit of an overview of the format. Uh, for the next hour, I'll be moderating our amazing panel of guests on the topic of safety through building community, second generation SEPTED strategies. As we go through the case studies, I'll ask each panelist to introduce them, themselves as they present their study. As time allows, we may have follow-up questions from me, the other panelists, and even the audience. If you'd like, please continue to check in on the chat with your name and location so we'll know who's joining us. But to submit a question to the panel or a specific panelist, please use the Q&A bar, not the general chat. If we're unable to address your question or comment and you'd like us to follow up, please email us at septed.usa at gmail.com, which is also in the chat, and indicate which panelist or maybe all of us that you'd like to connect with so we can follow up after the webcast. So as we begin, I do have a disclaimer. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the position of the ICA, SEPTED USA, or SEPTED Canada. The ICA assumes no legal responsibility for the speaker's statements. The ICA does not assume ownership of intellectual property, accuracy, or validity of the presented information. And now, a quick note about from our sponsor about an upcoming event that may be of interest to every single one of you. Announcing May 7th and 8th, 2024 in Palm Springs, California, a conference in crime prevention through environmental design, SEPTED. Be sure to save the date. A joint conference of the Canadian and the American chapters of the International SEPTED Association. Community building and empowerment, a holistic SEPTED approach conference will be held in Palm Springs, California at the Hilton Palm Springs Resort Hotel. We'll save the date and stay tuned for more details on this exciting conference. A special thank you to Greg Seville for putting that together. Next up, here's our agenda for the day. We'll do some introductions. We'll talk about Pompano Beach and their public safety plans. We'll talk about establishing community goals and priorities, some planning and case studies, We'll recap our topic, we'll ask and answer as many questions as we can, and then we'll talk about what comes next, or what will you do after this webinar is over. But first up, I want to turn things over to Greg Seville uh, to talk about the second generation approach. Thank you, Patrick. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right, good. Well, it's uh, Greg Seville here, everybody, from the great state of Colorado, uh, in the mountains here in Denver, and um, 
Um, we're delighted to uh, see you all here today and uh, and uh, talk to you a bit about what we what we did talk about back in November. Uh, so today uh, we're going to talk a bit about um, the downtown situation, the city situation, the blight situation, uh, the unhoused situation, toxic street drugs, all the things that we're seeing in our communities across both Canada and the U.S. and indeed around the world. Uh, the format we're using is the concept called second generation septet or community community based septet. Um, you're going to hear a lot about this at the conference. We're we're running in in uh, Palm Springs in uh, in May. We hope you'll join us for that. Um, more about that later. Second generation said that for those who are unfamiliar, evolved in the late 1990s. It's involved at the International Septet Association conferences as a result of work that was being doing for a long time. Uh, Septet practitioner and school principal Jerry Cleveland and myself put a paper together uh, back in uh, in Washington D.C. at the conference for the ICA in 1997, and the basic idea was. Was, was Jerry was discovering in school that if you got kids to actually do septet themselves, that they were more engaged with the actual process. And so that's kind of what, what triggered, planted the first seed. And what we learned over the years was early septet in the 60s and 70s uh, actually had community uh, in it, but it kind of uh, it kind of evolved out in, in the 90s with a lot of target hardening. So, so the septet concept, the second generation septet concept doesn't just happen. Uh, you don't teach a septic course and automatically it's it's second generation septic. That's not how it happens. It isn't just community participation. It's much more than that. And so what you'll see from this uh, from our approach and the second generation uh, approach is that there's specific strategies that gets the community engaged. And today we're going to show you some examples of that. We've got a slide on that, don't we, Patrick? Somewhere there. Right. So, so you see, we have, we have uh, three, that's like a formula. You have physical opportunity reduction, which is physical septed, you know, access control, territory, uh, lighting, and all the physical things you do to reduce crime opportunities in an environment. You add capacity building in the community. That is people who are willing to engage themselves, not just eyes on the street, but eyes that care on the street. That's a whole different sort of level to that. So you build capacity in the neighborhood and then, and then you add, you multiply that times the ability of people to work together. What, what sociologist Robert Sampson calls efficacy or, or in, in, in loose terms, cohesion. And that is what leads to long-term sustainable resilient communities to crime. So that's the formula. We're gonna use that approach in today's talk and, uh, and, and that's the setup. So Patrick, over to you. Thank you, Greg, very much for that. So first up, our next key speaker is Dr. Randy Atlas. I think you can see on your screen, I'm gonna go ahead and share back his PowerPoint. Randy, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you in Palm Springs for our SIPTED convention in uh, May 7th and 8th in Palm Springs. I'm gonna be talking about a uh, real world case study about um, the experience of Pompano Beach, Florida where they implemented a SIPTED ordinance in 2011 uh, with an officer there trained in SIPTED, Officer Patrick Noble, um, requiring all new developments and projects submit a public safety plan, which includes a narrative report and a computer-aided drafted drawing on how the proposed project or development will meet best practices of SIPTED and security strengthening. Of the six first-generation SIPTED strategies, access control, surveillance, territoriality, management, maintenance, you have legitimate activity support, which is sort of the basis of how people get involved in having legitimate activities and how it's gonna eventually carry over into second generation of cohesion and caring and uh, involvement of, of the people there in the community to reduce crime which is addressing how legitimate uses and legitimate users of a property can support security and order maintenance of a property. Attractive magnets of either nuisances or positive behavior can be for either legitimate or illegitimate activity, and as a result be either positive or negative activity gener generators. This can happen by the inclusion or placement of things such as dog walk areas, sitting areas, car wash areas, barbecue pits, walking trails, community center with a pool or gym, or other designated areas where people come together. Social management strategies in SIPTED include activities that seek positive human behavior 
as people interact with their environment. But does legitimate activity support really address community involvement? Activity support involves a sense of pride, a sense of ownership and user engagement. What are the consequences of not providing these community spaces is typically alienation of the people in that neighborhood, isolation, poor communications between law enforcement or property management and the residents, a general sense of mistrust and codependency where drug and alcohol use and people uh, checking out of participating in their life or existence, especially young people. Property management is the typical instigator or director of activities in residential communities. They approve or organize things like pool parties or hire bands or DJs, organize a picnic or barbecue, um, have uh, tennis or pickleball events, or develop a special event holiday theme parties like 4th of July, Memorial Day, Christmas Day, Martin Luther King Day, Easter Labor Day or engage the, the local school to do art, public art on their property or paint a wall with a mural or something of that nature. SIPTED can develop caring by having recognition and engagement. For example, using local artists from a local school, you know, and using local school children, developing a daycare for children so um, the mom or the parents can work, after school activities, computer workstations, hosting police presentations or PAL functions, having a police officer live in the property or program um, are all examples of programs that help residents to get to know each other and care for each other's wellness. When you know who your neighbor is, the SIPTED perspective is that you'll allegedly care about your neighbor. Senior communities organize card games, Scrabble tournaments, mall walks, transportation to medical offices and malls and local attractions, pickleball tournaments is big right now, and preparation for hurricanes and post-recovery efforts from storms are activities that bring communities together. How do you nurture caring though? That's the challenge. Getting legitimate users vested and involved, having good amenities, good communication, and having a general lack of fear of their environment uh, get people involved in speaking out and participation. And, the, and there needs to be consequences for bad actors and bad actions. Um, what I experience is that uh, there's a move towards just not holding people responsible or accountable anymore. So in summary, providing the physical environment that promotes legitimate activities by legitimate users is the foundation for a healthy and safe living environment. What takes the activity to another level is the organization, invitation, and inclusion of all residents, especially legitimate users and residents. That develops the consensus, community culture, the social cohesion, the connectivity, and nurtures a sense of ownership, sense of involvement, and sense of community. It is in the best interest of the property management company and ownership to use good design and inclusion of social activities to take activity support to the next level, second generation, of people knowing each other, caring about each other, and being responsible, the ability to respond, and accountable, the ability to account for. The required public safety plan of Pompano Beach ensures that the infrastructure is designed for and in place to facilitate the health, safety, and welfare of the people, property, development, and community. It takes a village, a holistic global perspective, which is the SIPTED way to provide innovation and inspiration for a smarter, safer, and more civil world. Thank you very much, Patrick. Next slide, please. Next person. Oh, thank you very much, Ernie. That was really good. I've got a couple of questions. We'll get to those here in a moment. But next up, Brene. Yes, hello. Good uh, Good morning, good afternoon, good night <laughs> to everybody around the world. This is Renee Barrent uh, calling in from Portland, Oregon. Uh, I'm an architect uh, by trade, and I really focus on the design of learning environments, aka schools, um, so educational facility design, and the role safety plays in those. And so today I have a really great example 
can go to the next one um, slide of um, a school district we work with. And they wanted to create really a framework for safety for several new school projects district wide. And they want to have also a very comprehensive discussion around safety. Because unfortunately, as an architect, normally, you know, there's a horrible event, there's a school shooting, and we get all these calls, oh my God, what can we do, what can we do? But there was actually no horrific event for this to happen. There was a desire from the district to have a comprehensive um, conversation with all groups in the district. And that was the first uh, actually effort in, you know, in sep second generation SEPTED and, and these efforts is identifying who should be at the table. And we wanted to have as many people from as many stakeholder groups at the table as possible. That included not only the students, uh, the teachers, administrators, custodial, groundkeepers, whatnot, but also community members uh, and parents, and especially community members from uh, previously maybe underrepresented groups, voices we don't hear. So we worked with the district um, and they actually created an outreach group to reach these community members. We had a lot of like specific ethnic social groups, uh, a lot of like Eastern European backgrounds and you needed different strategies to actually even invite those people to the table and really make them feel like their, their voices will matter and it will be heard, you know? So that was really, again, when you engage on second generation step that a little bit like what Randy said, like, who do you bring to the table? Who are your users? Who do you want to engage and who do you want to hear from? Because also for those people, you know, these are all the, the people who will hopefully benefit from, from any activity. So anyway, so that was the first, you know, like uh, efforts to get everybody together to settle on a date for everybody, bring everybody in one room and you can go to the next one and then really uh, create a really collaborative uh, workshop. Um, which really tackled, you know, the aspect of safety in all its dimensions. Um, and again, to allow all the people to work in small groups and large groups have a, a really, um, it was like a three uh, and a half to four hour session here, which was really productive and really intense in, a, in the conversation level and the results. Uh, so really interesting. You see here, there were different small group stations because we want to allow people we show up to actually each individual voices to be recorded and heard. And we have several strategies, uh, then how you actually get from the individual voice through a small group discussion conversation, you know, that filters out maybe what is the common message here for the group to actually presenting to a larger group and have the larger group take it from there and really um, establish what are the goals and priorities for, for each of the communities? What are the issues that matters to people? And uh, yeah, so I mean, recording all the input is really important and having a framework for that uh, to people really understand, yeah, that their presence is, is, is valid and it, it matters. Uh, the, go to the next one, please. Um, the framework we used is, I'm also a co-author of the Accepted in School uh, guidebook that was published, uh, I think now three years ago or so. And within that, we established like a safety security framework specifically tailored to educational environments, but it could also, of course, be tailored to other environments. So we identified several, uh, five categories. There were internal threats. There were, our, uh, sorry, external threats. There are internal threats. There's self-harm, which is a big issue in schools. There's threats to property and also environmental threats. And we basically uh, asked uh, the community group, I mean, except that we actually have some aspirations and strategies around this, but we wanted to make sure that we're addressing the needs of the specific district, the specific community we're working with. So we allowed the members, encouraged the members to create their own aspirations around external threats, internal threats, self-harm, threats to property. And we just basically facilitated the conversation and maybe uh, provided some clarification and some statistics. It was actually great. In this case, the district had a lot of statistical data in which they can actually document the number of internal threats, external threats, self-harm and threats of property over the course of a typical year. Again, having this data to support actually what people may be experiencing or what they're feeling is actually a, a concern was super helpful. And the lowest level, I mean, the lowest uh, bar there is then developing specific strategies. And if you go to the next one, this is just an example of we had this uh, gigantic poster in the room and you see we really handwriting notes and sticky notes, putting them on there while actually in, like, live in front of everybody. So everybody can see that their voices are being heard and recorded. 
And uh, based on that, of course, after this, you know, intense like three to four hour meeting, uh, we had an internal meeting with the district leadership. You go to the next one. And at this level, then we decided, you know, uh, which of these suggested uh, um, strategies uh, the district actually is willing and able to implement, which they may consider to implement, and actually also be clear about which they may likely not uh, implement. And there could be different reasons. There could be economic reasons, financial reasons, staffing reasons, whatever, or philosophical reasons, because they didn't agree. Um, at the end of this, there was published a white paper which was distributed district-wide, posted on the website, and made available to all attendees. And which again shows that these efforts are most successful if there's a high level of transparency, because even if the district decides not to implement maybe a strategy, there was a clear reason giving, there was a conversation, and people had an understanding, oh, it doesn't just fall off the, you know, off the of the dock here, docket, but actually there was a consideration, it was considered. My voice was heard, it was considered. But of course, not all items can be implemented. Again, really exciting stuff. And um, I love you to see you all at the conference in, in Palm Springs, where we talk more about second generation SEPTEF. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. So a couple notes. Uh, the chat is open for folks to drop where they're from. But if you have questions, please drop those in the Q&A function at the bottom of the uh, Zoom screen. So next up, we have Ms. Elizabeth Miller. There you are, Ms. Nilla. Thank you, Patrick. Um, hello, welcome. I'm very, very honored to be here. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Miller. I'm a senior planner in the city of Saskatoon in Saskatchewan, Canada. And if you can say that four times really fast, good on you. So we Saskatoon has been um, using SEPTAD as a way to um, make our community safer since the early, well, since the late 90s, early 2000s, it was, um, it was form formalized within, within the city. And because um, every community that we go into with our local area plans, that's our big planning process is, is um, a local area plan working with neighborhoods that are typically distressed and looking at what do they need? What do they want? So we go in, it's a community-based comprehensive planning process that works with the neighborhood anywhere up to 18 months. We look at all sorts of things, not just safety, but safety is always at the top of the list, but we do a lot of other things like, um, oh, infrastructure, uh, character, um, heritage, things like that. And and then and then uh, uh, we work directly with them to identify what is it that they're looking for. Next, Patrick. In Saskatoon, a, a neighborhood is is considered safe, or this is what we're aiming for: is a neighborhood that's able to help itself. So it can it can help solve its own problems. It has a, some form, some level of carrying capacity that can deal with problems. So, for example, if you have something really uh, traumatic happen in your neighborhood. How does the neighborhood deal with that? How can they, how can they um, help anybody? How can they, what, what can they, what can they do? And a neighborhood that can in a partnership with other stakeholders choose an effective solution and implement uh, something. They may need, they may need some expert help, but they also need to participate themselves. Next. And when we come to these um, recommendations, uh, we don't just stop involving the community then. What we find is to, to get a sustainable um, product or a result is that we, we still have to we still have to have the, the community uh, involved. And so we try to involve them in implementing recommendations as much as we can because it actually helps to successfully, achieve those safety goals that the community has has um, set out and helps them not only participate in the creation of the plan, but also in implementing it. And of course, they, they may not be able to participate in all of them, but they can in most of them. And then we want to set up a timeline so that, um, you know, we, we're looking at um, short term goals, medium term goals, long term goals. And because in the planning process, as some of you may know, if we're looking at uh, designing something from 
from scratch, you're looking at a 10 year process. So, so the timeline for implementing some of these um, can be long if you're doing zoning changes or things like that. Next. And these are just, uh, this is this is probably the biggest example of a recommendation that went through based on a local area plan, based on the principles of crime prevention through environmental design. And it wasn't just safety, but it was, but it was, safety was a big part of that. And this was in one of our most distressed neighborhoods, Pleasant Hill local area plan. We, we said we had we had over 50 just safety recommendations plus all the other recommendations and that information actually helped leverage another five million dollars in civic and provincial and federal money that looked at acquiring um, the distressed buildings that already existed there clean it up um, bring all the land together, developing new infrastructure, housing. And, and when that all came about, finally, and it was a really funny story because we were doing some work with the community in the Pleasant Hill School. It was the middle of winter. And if you know Saskatchewan, it happened to be a typical 40 below. Yes, 40 below centigrade. That's where we, that's where we live. And they had invited some provincial government members there. Pleasant Hill School, I, I swear somebody was working with us, Pleasant Hill School Boiler decided to go out the night before. We're all in there working with the community and the politicians, and we've got our jackets and our hats on. <laughs> but in the end, the provincial government announced a brand new, they call it a wellness center. So it's got, uh, it's got school, it's got before and after school programming. It's, it's got everything. Next. And this is the size of it. So this is Pleasant Hill, what we call Pleasant Hill Village. So the kind of orangey um, big building at the sort of the center of the screen at the top is that St. Paul's Hospital. So you can kind of see a little diamond that, um, that flows out from that, in t that's, that's like two blocks square and it's got um, seniors housing it's got the wellness center which is down um in the at the bottom of the screen it's got housing it's got multi-unit housing it's got row housing it's got everything and this was probably the most distressed part of of uh, saskatoon at the time next a smaller one was, so this is kind of the way a recommendation would be written, and it seems kind of awkward and long, but what we're trying to do is, is combine everybody uh, that needs to partner in here, including the community. You'll see that the community is actually identified in here as one of the stakeholders. This was a and under uh, underneath a bridge and there's a, a lovely pathway along the river. This is the bridge abutment and it always gets tagged and looks horrible. And so one of the recommendations was to um, for the community to hire um, an artist and using input from the community itself would actually design. Um, she, she was going to do a wheat paste mural next. And this is the this is the wheat paste mural. Um, that she did uh, and put on the bridge abutment. So this was based on a, a drawing that she had done previously, but then she she spent time on one of uh, Nutana's busiest commercial streets and she talked to all the community and they gave her input into what they'd like to see and the colors that they wanted and that type of thing. And she was able to let them know that, you know, where this came from and it was from a local area plan. Uh, the unfortunate is that the wheat paste mural didn't last very long and wheat paste murals are not meant to. So that, that was, that was kind of interesting. We got some, some criticism, uh, but also some um, way to goes uh, for this particular process. Next. And what we try not to do is to forget that the thank you to the community. So we do a number of things around, we may have a, a potluck at the end. Um, we'll go to some some sort of um, festival within the community to to connect with them and say say thank you. All of those things are important because 
we know that to implement the rest of the recommendations, once the creation of the local area plan is finished and the safety recommendations are established, which I should say that safety recommendations actually go to city council. The, 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 the um, local area plan is approved by city council. It's also been vetted, of course, through the community. So when those recommendations come out, like the one that you saw on the paper, uh, wheat paper, uh, wheat paste mural, that recommendation has been vetted by the community, by the various departments that are mentioned in the recommendation, and also by um, by the community itself. So if you have a change in staff, for example, one engineer leaves, another one comes in and they go, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. They can't do that because it's a, it's been a, it's a council approved document, so they have to carry it out. And so what we find is... Um, the struggle to get the community to participate is always there, but we find that when the community participates and participates in a really good, a really good, positive and effective way that, that they're happy to participate and they want to continue on. They want to do what they, what they can do for their community and make it safer for everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you, ma'am. So, I have the privilege of giving the next uh, case study. It's something kind of homegrown for where I'm at here in Dallas, but it's a program called, or it's a location called uh, originally the Boneyard, um, as a lot of communities struggle with, as Randy said earlier, uh, activity, particularly human activity and hopefully positive activity. Uh, skateboarding as a culture is something that some people look down upon. It's looked at as being a counterculture or even uh, criminal in some nature. But one of the things a lot of communities struggle with it's also one of the fastest growing uh, physical activities for youth uh, in North America. And so how do you sort of accommodate that? And when this project came to us, uh, it was presented as if you don't have a skate park, your entire city is a skate park. Because you can see the individual there, it's basically concrete, something vaguely flat and wheels, and you've got what you need. Uh, so the challenge that was presented before us, both as a city, um, our planners, our engineers, and our designers was how do you incorporate something like that to meet the community you need to serve. And Randy, or I'm sorry, Renee was nice enough to talk a lot about uh, stakeholders. And one of the first things we did was try to figure out what problem are we trying to solve and who are we trying to solve it for? And SEPTED had a big part of that. Uh, we actually held multiple design workshops. This is actually one of them. Uh, coincidentally, the designer is the gentleman in the uh, blue shirt in the middle or to the left who actually is from Canada. So apparently all the best skate park designers come from Elizabeth's uh, neck of the woods. Uh, but we actually had multiple design workshops where we met with and invited youth uh, from all over our community, all over the region even, uh, to discuss what they would do, what activities uh, were they, what would they want to see, what would draw them there. Um, you can kind of see some of the planning uh, charts in the center there. Uh, Renee had done the uh, sticky voting as well, and we did the exact same thing. Uh, we actually presented different features. What would you want this activity? What would make it yours? Uh, believing that if it made it theirs, uh, it would be something that would carry forward. It is definitely trying to incorporate the social piece to it. Um, as I sort of move through this program, all the children in there, uh, two of them are actually professionals. Uh, if you look at the, I'll just call them the shortest of the people there is actually a professional skater who uh, skates on YouTube uh, videos and has continued to do and continues to do some more skating than I would ever try on my best day. Uh, all the way down to amateur skaters and people that wanted to go with their uh, children, grandchildren, whomever. But as we did these sessions, we came up with the title from the crowdsourcing thing, and we named the program The Boneyard. And it was actually when it opened in Garland, Texas, it was the second largest skate park in the state of Texas. Uh, you can kind of see some of the features there. One thing I do want to remind everybody else is that if we look through the uh, participants in there, you've got small children, uh, even some older folks. You've even got some parents that are participating as well with their families. Uh, up on the top right, you'll see a nice little placard about we actually organized litter cleanups at the park. Uh, the facility is kind of hard to envision what it used to be, but it was a disused baseball stadium uh, that had been served by many of them in many communities uh, for programs like baseball that uh, may have had their time and may be underutilized, and that was repurposed into this. That activity level there is pretty consistent for almost any given day at this property. The reason I also wanted to bring it up on this topic is something Greg talked earlier about, um, is the sort of social piece. And there's an image there of John Comer. Uh, you might notice that he is an adaptive skateboarder and he's actually from Garland, Texas. Uh, when the Boneyard opened, it seemed like a kitschy name that all the kids would like. It seemed very uh, consistent with the culture they were trying to meet. 
However, John Comer is a hometown hero. He was one of the first elite adaptive athletes in the field of skateboarding. And uh, there was a public, not really an outcry, but a uh, support and an organizational push to rename the park from the Boneyard to the John Comer Park in recognition of his contributions to skating and to the city and the community. And ironically, it's a great example of how we built it with community support. We identified a flaw in it uh, based on the naming of it and were actually able to recognize um, a local hero within it as well and give him the respect he does, which actually helps uh, give the entire property the feeling of this is ours. This belongs to the people that use it. It's all about ownership and community, which is something Randy mentioned earlier. Um, so that's sort of that program and how well it used. And it's uh, to me a perfect example locally of how stakeholders and community support can bring something that could come in as controversial and has actually become a quite a positive thing for our community. So next up, I'd like to introduce Greg Seville. Greg, it's all yours. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so uh, I'm going to recap a little bit and then talk a bit about some some of the concepts you've heard so far. Um, I was very struck by Rennie's comments about the school and how you apply SEPTED in school, but second generation SEPTED in school, uh, and particularly his reference to the SEPTED ICA school guidebook, which is something you can get on the ICA website. That's not just a checklist. It's a way to engage residents. And I think Rennie was uh, was quite right to point that out. Um, uh, Elizabeth's uh, uh, points that I thought were relevant, uh, certainly it struck me, was when she made the comment of how much time it takes to implement some of these ideas. And if you're new to this game, the question is, how do you keep engaging people over the long term? And I think because keeping involvement is the key, and that wellness center she described was a great example of that. Um, and I think really what, what this is called is community building. This is what this is. And this is part of what, what we need to be doing here. Um, in, 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 in Patrick's case, uh, Patrick, that was a great example of glass half full, glass half empty, where you can take, you know, uh, uh, what's seen as a liability with your kids in skate parks and turn it into an, an asset in the community, which I think is so powerful. Uh, and the classic example of how you make something that's negative into something that's positive. That is the essence of, 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 of secondary susceptibility. And then finally, Randy's comments, and Randy have, and I have had many, many discussions over the years about his work in Florida and elsewhere. And one of the interesting things about that, I think, is, is when you look at what the difference between the second and first generation set that is, there's a tendency to say, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, in natural surveillance, natural surveillance is, is part of the set that story. Well, it is, but it's not just the eyes on the street that matter. It's whose the eyes are and do the eyes care. I think that's the point. One of the points that Randy was making. Another example is activity support, which a lot of first generation people use. Say you activate an area with, uh, you know, legitimate activities and you displace the le legitimate activities, you know, that kind of thing. But the issue with that is what that's doing is essentially putting people in an area that needs eyes there. In other words, eyes on the street. In other words, that's just first generation septed with spice on it. So the difference in what, with the second generation septed and the examples you've heard so far is it's not just putting people into a place to put eyes on there. It's getting people to get to know each other so they actually start to care. That th This is the essence of community building. People who have compassion, people have some training, at least some knowledge about what to do in SEPTED, and also that they're connected with others outside the neighborhood. Those are kind of the key elements. So what I want to do is I want to give you a couple of examples of work that I've been engaged with uh, over, over the years and, and show you exactly what that looks like. Uh, so Patrick, if you could uh, slip to that first slide there. We'll, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some, some flavor of, of the kinds of things you can do. So for example, how do you, in activating public spaces, what does it mean? Well, here's a, a neighborhood an intersection where they'd had a young woman who was run over by a car and the stop signs weren't stopping cars. And the neighbors, this was driven by uh, Oregon architect, uh, um, Mark Lakeman, who's behind the city repair movement. And he does a lot of this work and this is one of his, his intersections. And so, you know, the idea was how do you not just change the design of the intersection, make it active with, you know, a little tea station and a book, book repository and all that kind of thing, but to get people themselves to do it. It's the, it's the, the people themselves doing it that makes the difference. I stood at this intersection for 20 minutes and every car uh, that came here stopped and yet the stop signs had been removed. And so they actually enhanced the safety, improved the neighborhood, um, in, in, in reduce the accidents and got folks to work together in, in a kind of a social way. And they do this, there's like 70 or 80 neighborhoods and, and this is uh, a suburb in uh, Portland and there's now in 15 cities across the US and Canada where they're doing this regularly now. So this is one example of how residents themselves can co-design uh, strategies. Next slide, please. 
So here's another example. This was a project we did in New Orleans, which in a very high crime community, uh, in fact, a community where the rapper Lil Wayne came out of. We talked a lot of raps with uh, with gangs and shootings and drugs and that kind of thing. And, and the residents there, we did analysis with them, looked at the patterns of crime and the, the fear levels and that kind of thing. And we, one of the areas they identified was the photograph on the left, which was a bus stop. And, and a, a dilapidated bus stop with no lighting and graffiti and all the rest of it. And that's where a lot of the theorists have been triggered from, where there have been many assaults and, and, uh, and shootings and whatnot in this location. And you look at it and you go, well, that makes sense. Let's just fix it up. But it wasn't the fixing it up. It wasn't the improving the lighting. It wasn't the access control that mattered in this case. It was the fact that the residents themselves were taught how to do this. We worked with them over you know, weeks and months, and they, they, they together decided to build their own uh, a bus shelter, which they did. And there it is on the right. And it's used recycled materials. We brought the local architecture school in to, to help with the design because they knew where to get recycled stuff. And, and the residents felt a sense of pride over this. The bus department, interestingly, would say, oh, you can't put that in, in your neighborhood, Holly Grove neighborhood uh, bus stop because, you know, people would vandalize it. And I went, look at the bus stop on the left and tell me that you, you actually care about vandals in your community. You, that's been there for 10 years. Uh, the, the, the shelter on the right is built by the neighbors. And in, the, in 10, 15 years, that it's still there. It hasn't been vandalized because the residents care about it and they take care of it. They have some ownership over it. That's the power of this kind of an approach. Oops. Did I lose you? Okay, there we go. Uh, so... Here's an example of how we actually get folks to work together. We we do a lot of the things you heard Elizabeth and Patrick describing. We have uh, design charrettes. We have sessions before any septet goes in place. We talk about it. They teach. They learn a bit about septet, and they start to do some rough designs themselves. Now they're not finished designs. They're not architects. But we bring that expertise later. The key is that it's their input. That's what matters. This builds some skills. This builds the what we call capacity building. The residents themselves learn, the neighbors themselves, the members of the organization themselves, the people around the park, whatever it happens to be. They themselves learn how to do some of this themselves. They Oh, I think we may have lost Greg for just a moment, but all the things he's talking about seem to match how we get our community members to engage in their own community. That capacity building is a really key piece. How do they talk like someone who wants to have ownership of their property? How do they want to engage those different areas from an edge case standpoint of what do these government entities do? What are these sort of technical skills uh, that all the people on our panel actually provide? How do you communicate that to the members of those communities? Um, as I'm waiting for Greg to come back, I think I'm going to diverge a little bit because I do have a follow-up question for a couple of folks. Uh, one of them is for Elizabeth, and this actually kind of bounces off of what uh, Greg was talking about. Um, how do you deal with public spaces and poor behavior that affects at the, at these spaces that affects everybody? And then we get requests to take out the benches and lock up the parks. How do you address that, Elizabeth? <laughs> well. I put the question in, it was from me to the panel. So I don't have the answer. That's why I'm asking it. So we we have some difficulty with that, partly because of, uh, you know, it, it, things that happened during the pandemic with, with uh, drug use and addiction and homelessness, et cetera, et cetera. And quite often now we'll have potentially inappropriate uses in a public space, like, on the public streets, in the amenity strips, in the parks, and so often, what people want to do right away is they want to they want to sh they want to shut it down, they want to lock it up, and they just want to keep those people out. So, how do we how do we do that? How do we how do we um, make our space inviting for people that potentially need to sit down as they walk through the downtown <clears throat> with the with the with the ability of say business owners to recognize that not everybody sitting on their benches is going to do something bad. I, I, and I'd Randy, be curious to hear the rest of them. Randy, I'm gonna give you a shot at that one. What do you think? So you it's important Randy to or provide Randy? people the opportunity. Oh, Randy. Randy, good. Yeah, it's important to provide people the opportunity 
to participate and engage, but there needs to be consequences if there are bad actors and acting badly and with incivilities. So in, that's why the whole intermittent railing of benches came about because if we provide the infrastructure for people to sleep on the benches, then people are going to do that. And that's not a normal legitimate function of a park area. Um, and there's architectural measures we can do to make it difficult to skateboard so you don't tear up the balustrade walls and to tear up the railings and or to sleep on places where you don't want them to sleep. Um, and the goal would be, from my perspective, either, you know, if the parks are being used legitimately and they're being patrolled and they're being supervised and people are being held accountable for their actions, then great, they can remain open. One of my interesting lessons was when I went to Reno and uh, went to a park after a late night there and Trish and I walked around and the park was just alive because people work 24 seven in Reno because of the casinos. And whereas normally I would have said, oh, the parks need to close when the sun goes down. This park was alive and thriving, people walking their dogs and jogging and just participating because there was enough legitimate users to counterbalance the normal people that would hang around in a dark park at three or four or five o'clock in the morning. So it, it, it really is about this balance between supervision and, and holding people accountable and the activities taking place in that space. Thank you, sir. I think Greg has joined us in and I'm just going to catch him up really fast. Um, Elizabeth asked a question about how do you deal with public spaces and poor behavior at those spaces that impacts everybody. Um, because a lot of times it ends up with requests to take out the benches, lock up the parks, yeah. and sort of surrender parts of our community. Well, you don't rely on technology, that's for sure, as you can see, tell from me getting bounced out of this. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious, I'm quite serious. I mean, there is a, t a tendency to use technology, to use cameras, robots, and those kinds of things to solve the problems for us. Um, and there may be a role for technology. We use cameras all the time in the right places, but they're always the, always the last resort. The first resort is always working with the people themselves. You know, the skate park next to the senior center, uh, I remember a case years ago on British Columbia, police officer, a very good perceptive police officer, realized that but rather than fencing off the skate park and trying to control the noise complaints from seniors, he introduced the seniors to the kids, got them to know each other. The, the kids started doing demonstrations for the seniors. The seniors would go over with long on chairs and watch these shows it became an entertainment social matter you know it's the social component that's going to drive the physical not the other way around i know there's a lot of traditional septet people and who teach septet who don't who use you know social social septet or septet second gen septet as a powerpoint slide and they move on they do a disservice to the concept and the philosophy of what the founders of this movement were trying to say so the social community building needs to be part of our of our language it needs to be part of the training we provide, how you get together, how you resolve conflict, how you become self-aware, how you work together as a team, how you plan. Those are part of SEPTED too. So, so Greg, I'm going to grab this one back. I know it's kind of sort of answers Elizabeth's question, but it, I really want to get Greg's thoughts on this next one because um, this was literally your next slide. Um, so I'm really curious when you look at these individuals that are at an abandoned, what could be an abandoned park, a vacant lot. Yeah. Does that sort of incorporate yeah. what you're that's exactly what I'm talking about. So here's here's a, in New Orleans again. Here's an area where there's a vacant property. The owner says, "I'm going to sell it, but it's going to take you know ten years." In the meantime, why don't you turn it into a garden? They turned it into a farm where the kids could become could learn about diet, learn about farming, learn about you know uh, biology and chemistry in their classes. The community went there. They grew produce and they turned it into an actual market where the neighbors were part of the whole you know neighborhood building neighborhood farm in that community and they actually started to sell and make a profit. They made like half a million dollars a year, which went back into the community. Capacity building and neighborhood co cohesion can have a huge impact on crime. That community's uh, shooting rate went from 20 or 30 down to like two, two per year. And it wasn't just the farm that did it. It was all the interrelated aspects of ca capacity building and neighborhood cohesion. And, and they didn't use government funds for it. They had their own funds now because they had a, a local industry from this, in, this, uh, in this farm that they were able to do it. And when the owner sold the the property ten years later, they had other things to replace it. So they were they were they were ready to go. A disorganized uh, community to a socially organized community. That's that's so the Greg, point of that slide. So Greg, last thing, um, give us one recap. I do have a couple of questions I want to address before we run out of time. But if you can run over this one more time before I go to the questions. Well, I, and everything you've seen so far says this. It says 
but it's not just physical opportunity reduction. Those are important. You need to do that. First gen set that needs to drive this agenda. However, it needs to be uh, it needs to be combined and partnered with the ability to build capacity in neighborhoods, teach them how to do it so that they're part of the story. You heard that from Elizabeth. You heard that from Rene. And also how you sustain community building over the long term by having a cohesive community. That example I just showed you in the uh, in the in the in the farm. And that's how you build uh, resilient communities to crime and fear. Thank you, sir. I do have a couple of questions I want to get to. Um, I'm going to give this one. I'd like to get an opinion from both Randy and Elizabeth on that in whichever order you'd like to answer it. Uh, but Tiffany Jennings actually asked us, discuss how we can better incorporate SEPTED principles when installing bike facilities and other related infrastructure improvements. Um, for time, I've got about a minute per person to respond. I'll start off first, uh, Elizabeth. And from the architectural infrastructure perspective, the bikes need to be an area where they're under natural surveillance and also mechanical surveillance for accountability. And the bike racks need, need to be where there's good lighting and good access. So it's the good design is very important. I've gone into many places where they put the bike rack on the side or edge of a building where there's no one can watch it. And then they wonder why no one's using no one's using it and putting their bikes there. It has the bike racks need to be properly with security strengthening anchored and yet be an area where they can be observed and have accountability. Liz? Thanks. Um, the way our program is set up, uh, we have a SEPTED review committee. So all civic structures, facilities and developments have to have to go through a SEPTED review. And what we find is that since, since the private sector has kind of seen some of the things that we've done, we actually have the private sector coming and asking us to look at their stuff as well. But I would say at at the at at the earliest possible time that you can you can get those plans in there and look at everything that Randy talked about the 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 juxtaposition of where you are where the doors are where the windows are do you have natural surveillance all those types of things even to a point you can move into second generation with with having the user group like the bikers look after their own stuff as they go along. Okay. So this one is for Greg, and I've got one final one for Renee, but uh, this one directly for Greg. Can the community care SEPTED Eyes on the Street integrate with neighborhood watch programs if they still even if they even still exist? If they still exist, exactly. Yeah, of course they can. I mean, you know, neighborhood watch you know, had its day and it was effective for a while and then many times it's not. We have a neighborhood watch in, uh, sign in my neighborhood which nobody's ever heard of it before. So it, it, it has a, a long, it has a, a half life of about 10 years. So, um, but I think it can be revived with SEPTED training, but I kept, again, I come back to the key that, that, that it, it has to do with learning the social community building, capacity building skills, as well as the access control lighting skills as well. They're part of the new language in SEPTED. This is a new era. And, and, and what I see one of the questions in the Q&A there says, is there a SEPTED design peer group that can help me do some stuff in, in Florida? Yeah, yeah, it, it, you're looking at it. It's the ICA SEPTED USA and I say SEPTED Canada. We're it. That's why we started this group. The conference in May is going to be where you can meet your, your peers. We're having regular meetings, workshops, uh, newsletters. That's how you learn about this stuff and set up these peer groups is from other people who are advanced and have expertise in this area. Well, since Greg stole my question, I'm going to ask it anyway because I'm the moderator. Uh, this one's for Renee. So how do you as a SEPTED professional seek out other peers in this industry? I mean, I know the conference is one of them, but how else... Can we reach out? Who do you turn to for help? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Greg said it all. It's basically the ICA. For me, it became the ICA. You know, I learned about the ICA or SEPTED through a colleague, actually, because I was concerned, you know, um, that school districts were doing things that uh, they felt maybe created security, but I felt maybe they were actually compromising learning because they were putting more barriers up than actually bringing people together. So again, and then I learned, you know, through uh, proposing uh, an abstract for a SEPTED uh, topic at the ICA conference in beautiful, uh, it was Cancun, it was. And so I met all my fellow colleagues here at ICA, you know, and now we're having this uh, brand new uh, SEPTED USA chapter. And I think Canada was also just uh, was created. So actually, yes, this is the community now, I think, that we all seek and uh, where we can find each other, basically, you know, I think we're, we're, we're it. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to grab the screen back one more time to bring us home. Uh, first, thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, we have a lot of folks from all over the country, all over the world that have been attending. Uh, we will have, I think Matea said this will go out later on as a recording. So those that want to kind of go back through it and parse the words, those sort of things. 
Um, but if you want to learn more about SEPTED USA or SEPTED Canada, uh, you can see it all at the uh, SEPTED.net uh, slash North America, the umbrella initiative that covers all of us. Uh, and then just because it's been brought up by all of us, one more time. Announcing May 7th and 8th, 2024 in Palm Springs, California, a conference in crime prevention through environmental design, SEPTED. Be sure to save the date. A joint conference of the Canadian and the American chapters of the International SEPTED Association. Community building and empowerment, a holistic SEPTED approach. The conference will be held in Palm Springs, California at the Hilton Palm Springs Resort Hotel. Don't save the date and stay tuned for more details on this exciting conference. At the risk of being too meta about this topic, um, this is our community. This is the social cohesion that makes SEPTED work at our level as well. So I hope everybody will take advantage of those opportunities to network, to meet everybody else, to reach out. Um, we are going to open a call for presenters for our conference. Uh, those should be coming out next week. But if you have any questions about the conference, anything else that wasn't answered here that you want to reach out and don't have a contact, please grab the septet.usa at gmail.com email, um, and we'll get that to everyone else involved. If there's a question that we didn't get to, uh, one you think of in about 10 minutes, which is what normally happens to me, um, or ever, feel free to reach out. We'll get you an answer from whichever panelist you'd like, or even all of us at that point. Uh, we are really close to the hour, but I'd like some final comments uh, from everybody. I'm going to start backwards with Renee on my screen. Yes, I mean, yeah. again, another reminder of how important SEPTED um uh, the second generation SEPTED is, and actually now actually we're moving into the third generation even, which also includes the psycho-emotional environment. And at uh, our level, at a committee level at ICA, we now developed a new SEPTED uh, assessment actually tool uh, for school facilities first, uh, in which we're actually investigating not only the physical, but also the social and psycho-emotional environment. So actually we're building on these generations to create more tools for you all to use. Yeah, and thank you for attending today. Uh, Elizabeth, last 10 seconds. What you got? Um, I would say um, work with your community. Your your community, you know, don't think you know everything. That the community will come up with some things that 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 may surprise you. But if you want it to be sustainable, you have to work with the community and with the other the other stakeholders. And um, as Renee said, um, you know, working with working with the younger generation with the kids for me is is uh, really really interesting. And and doing SEPTED with uh, children and youth uh, is very similar, but can give you some really good insights. Um, thanks, Patrick. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Greg, 10 seconds. Yeah, look, this is a new century. Uh, Septed was come out of the last one, and we need to move forward and move ahead. And uh, we face all kinds of challenges, and the best way to do to, to meet those challenges is to work together in a, a spirit of camaraderie and companionship. And this is it, so please join us. Randy, last words. Maximum value is gained by your full participation. If you're a bystander, you don't ever make a difference in the world. So your participation in our conference and the chapter and in your communities makes a positive difference. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So on behalf of all of the panelists, thank you guys all for joining in. I hope you grab some information. I hope you all continue to make contacts. Keep up with everybody else. Hope to see everybody else soon. And we'll see you at the next webinar. Everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you very Thanks, much. Panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Bye-bye.